you know, humans as a race, comes from our sense of optimism. We want to be optimistic. We want to be hopeful. We want to see progress and improvement. Years and years of pain, and then, you know, something doubles and all of a sudden we're back, baby, right? We're so back. I mean, these are not just survivors. These are believers, right? The last 30 days was close to 900 million US dollars. So we're hitting a billion dollars a month almost now. Again, I think 2024 is going to be a pretty good year from all accounts. It's just such a better future. This one conversation made me insanely bullish about the future of Web3, the metaverse, and NFTs. While everybody was declaring it dead, people like Yatsu, the chairman of Animoca Brands, were building and investing in the space. And what comes next when the crypto cycle ramps back up is going to blow your mind. You have to listen to this if you want to know about the future of Web3. That's dope. So you're my last gig of the day. <laughs> last gig of the day at one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Do you usually keep those out? I'm also a non-sleeper at four or five hours for me. And I feel like I've already wasted part of my day. But I hear I, I, everyone tells me that's really unhealthy and I should be sleeping nine hours a day and tracking my sleep. I can't. You know, that's what people used to say to me as well. But I don't I don't feel low energy. See, that's the thing. So if I was, I think I, think, um, I was reading a study, and this is not for everyone, of course, but I was reading a study that there are some people who are just fine with three or four uh, hours of sleep. And while technically, on average, it's not supposed to be healthy, I think even I think even uh, in the Huberman podcast, who's like pretty pretty good about this stuff, he was kind of saying, "Look, there are some people who can who, who this is fine, and that's not him." But you know, like, uh, and then there seems to be no sort of debilitating effects. So. Maybe we we're those kind of guys. I have no idea. I like, hope so, because it feels this. like that means we get a meaningful percentage more of a uh, awake life to enjoy over everybody else. But it's never bothered me. I've read similar articles, but I think I seek them out so I can cope with my uh, lack yeah, of it's sleep. Confirmation bias. Confirmation it's bias. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, of exactly. So, yeah. So speaking of confirmation bias, uh, you have the Mochaverse coming, right? I, I thought the Metaverse yeah. was dead. I thought the Metaverse was dead. We had buried it. We were a bunch of uh, people with no legs running around and uh, to our graves. But apparently, apparently a lot of the narratives from the last cycle that people have been diligently working on are not, in fact, dead. Is that true? Absolutely. It's come back really strong. I mean, when you think of, but I think one of the reasons why people talk about the Metaverse as being dead and this is something that I experienced when I gave my TED talk actually earlier this year, oh, it feels like ages ago, was that a lot of people thought it was dead because they thought the metaverse was meta, as in Facebook. And so for people who are in Web3, uh, we would sort of kind of scoff at the thought that Facebook is the metaverse. But for people outside of our industry, actually, you know, you know, it's it's their reality. Because so so when Meta's version of the metaverse, which is Oculus and which is Horizon and all that stuff, is not working out, then they take the perspective that it must be failing. But actually, even during the bear market, there was building, there was economies, there was employment, right? Obviously, it wasn't like the bull market of like years before. But, you know, we're ending the year pretty strongly in the sense that NFT sales are now, you know, which to us are the digital properties of the metaverse. The last 30 days was close to 900 million US dollars. So we're hitting a billion dollars a month almost now, again. And the total sort of, I guess, asset value of essentially all of, I guess, the, the token values, uh, underpinned obviously by Bitcoin, I think is now somewhere between 1.4 to 1.5 trillion dollars. And so that basically creates a lot of economic scale and activity and growth and income and usage. So I would say, you know, it was a bear market for everything, uh, not just in crypto, but uh, and in the open metaverse. But it's it's come back pretty strong, and I think 2024 is going to be a pretty good year from all accounts. I think that we know that human beings expect things to happen much quickly than they do, right? So in each cycle, we say, "Oh, the metaverse is here, NFTs are here, it's now. We're going to see it all come to fruition," and then it takes quite a few years. But they're equally bad at understanding what happens after they go exponential, right? That parabolic hockey stick of things. I think we were just a bit early in the last phase. Uh, we were just seeing the early iterations of what all of these things could be. And that maybe in this cycle, whether, you know, I don't know how the cycles will play out, we'll start to see the real 
sort of use cases and adoption of the most impactful parts of it. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. And I think it's also because it takes time to develop the ecosystems in the metaverse or any kind of product that you're building. So for instance, many of the utilities in the metaverse, you know, it's like, you know, basically gaming activities, for instance, like uh, GameFi being a really big, big sort of area. It takes two, three, four years to make really good games. It doesn't really matter, you know, whether this is traditional games or Web3 games. It just takes time to make good games. Most of those games uh, that we funded and other companies funded were around 21 and 22. So they're just about coming out, actually, in the next 12 months, right? And and those are the games that people are going to love. And those are the games that are going to sort of meet the kind of bar that traditional gamers might say, oh, actually, I think I'll play that as well, irrespective of whether it's Web3 or not. They're just going to enjoy it. And they're going to sort of experience the benefit of what digital ownership really means in the open metaverse and the ability to basically potentially sort of, you know, trade them, transact with them, do other things with them that you couldn't actually normally do in game items, for instance. So I think that's going to be a big part of that transition. The other thing, of course, is maturation as well, which is that the community of people in the Web3 space who came in, especially in the last few years, and have survived the bear market are a special kind of breed, right? I mean, these are not just survivors, these are believers, right? So in some ways, when you think about sort of this sort of trial by fire type of situation that's happened in the industry in the last 12 to 18 months, come you come out stronger. You you come out be sort of believing much more about it because the cause is bigger than your your own, right? You're just you're, you're still here. Why are you still here? Well, because you believe in this, because you think it's meaningful, because it's important. And then when the market is recovering, as it has done for the last 30 days, that belief is just super reinforced in terms of this conviction that you're seeing, which you can now feel throughout the ecosystem, right? It's not just happening in sort of Bitcoin and Ethereum. Every token is generally sort of sort of showing confidence and showing strength. Um, you know, game fire projects are particularly uh, sort of positively affected, uh, and and um, you know people are talking about it in very positive ways. Plus, some of the big industry events that people were concerned around, such as you know Bitcoin spot ETF, that seems to be pretty clear that it will come out. It's just a matter of you know when, not if, uh, and that'll have an impact. And of course, the situation with Binance um, had a lot of unclarity before. People knew something was happening. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know how serious it could be. And the settlement, I think, really settled a lot of things in the industry in terms of, you know, knowing that, well, okay, um, finance is going to be around. Things are going to sort of progress in a positive way. You know, um, mistakes may have been made, but we move on. And, you know, customer funds are safe, you know, no fraud took place, you know, like yeah. that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So, so I think people, you know, just generally feel positive. And the other thing I generally feel as well, um, I don't know that a lot of people necessarily would agree with this, but I think people... Um, maybe more in Web3, who knows, um, you know, the, the resiliency of humanity or, you know, humans as a race comes from our sense of optimism, right? We, we, you know, we wouldn't be making the kind of progress we have made as humans if we weren't naturally inclined to be optimistic. Um, and so I think when, um, when we see these signals, we want to be optimistic, we want to be hopeful, we want to see progress and improvement. And when we get these signals and they come bit by bit, our confidence builds very quickly and that's actually what I think we're witnessing at this moment in time, which is really quite exciting and empowering to see. It's incredible how fast we forget the bad times, <laughs> to, to your point. It's been years and years of pain, and then you know, something doubles, and all of a sudden, we're back, baby, right? We're so back. Yeah. <laughs> um, about Binance, I think you make a great point. I think one of the more sort of nuanced views of what happened with Binance is, Binance is that even if you do get the worst case scenario and something terrible happened and they are in trouble with platforms moving forward, I think we now know that the roadmap for the United States is to give them a huge fine and continue on, right? And, and so I think that now when the biggest platform, we see exactly how they were treated. They were somewhat treated like Wall Street banks, by the way, you know, in the past when they've mm -hmm. ha uh, had uh, bad activity or whatever you want to call it. So I think that there's just optimism that even if another shoe drops at this point, it's not going to be that bad. We know this is the if this is the worst that's yes. going to happen, then nothing's going to, you know, tank the industry further like an FTX or all the things we saw last year. Yeah. And I think the other thing that at least we took as very positive is also the fact that from a narrative standpoint, the US isn't really out to kill crypto. Yeah. 
which of course, you know, and, and while there may be different departments in the US government that might have taken, that may have different perspectives, who knows, <laughs> depending on the actions that we see. But broadly speaking, you know, if the US actually wanted to really, really sort of, you know, uh, kick crypto in the shin, then they would have done something very different. And they didn't. They, they had the them, chance, as you said, <laughs> like banks, right? Yeah, yeah. it's, and, it's and not a monolith, that, yeah. right? The, like you said, different politicians, different parties, different parts of those different parties, different regulators, yes. you know, and, and not one of them has enough yes. power to sort of enact the worst case scenario. Exactly. So I think that's actually quite encouraging. And I think the market reflected that as well. So I want to talk about gaming since we just started talking about it. Obviously, I've sort of made the argument that once again, we were just too early last cycle. We had no real adoption from a AAA game that existed of a blockchain or crypto side, right? Now, Fortnite and Call of Duty didn't add NFTs, right? And we also, to your point before, didn't see a AAA game come from native blockchain houses, right? You said you started investing them in 21, 22. Of course, that takes three, four years and maybe hundreds of millions of dollars to build some of these games. Do you think that some of the most hyped gaming projects of the last cycle, I invested in Star Atlas and Alluvium and all these, do you think they did themselves a disservice by actually launching the token at the point that they did when the game itself wasn't ready? So first, I think generally where we're going with gaming, um, before we even talk about AAA, is that we have to also look at the life cycles of where we are in terms of the gaming evolution and the adoption of gaming. And I think one of the challenges that the industry has had broadly is that when you look at the Venn diagram of people who are in Web3, and then you look at the people who are actually playing games, which is most of the world, it's like over 3 billion people, actually the intersection of them isn't actually quite as big as we hope it is, because the Web3 audiences is generally smaller. And so, so what's happened is, is that um, the expectation that you know Web3, sort of let's call them Web3 people, would all play games is, um, is not true, in the sense that also that Web2 gamers would just simply move over to play Web3 games is also not true, right? right? There has to be sort of a mix and there is a Venn diagram where you meet them in the middle that, that is small. And so there is different type of game elements that we have to design and play to onboard people from Web2 to Web3 and to make the engagement of people in Web3 participate in this gaming environment, which actually I think happens a lot through the NFT and the tokens before the game is launched, or that is actually the gameplay of those particular users. Meaning that there's a meta game layer that happens in tokenized games, in Web3 games, that doesn't really exist in traditional games, but the meta game is something that already happens in traditional game design. So for instance, when you play your popular games, whether it be Fortnite or, for instance, Clash Royale, for instance, or even games like Candy Crush, the gameplay itself obviously may be fun and entertaining, but actually where you spend the money, where you actually engage in the activity of your planning, is the meta game like you wait for the chest to open, for instance, or you sort of go and scroll through the items and you sort of you know strategize around building your deck, for instance, or you know what weapons you choose and that kind of thing. That's the meta game inside traditional games, and that meta game now has found an extension in Web three games, and that happens to be through the token and through the ownership of these NFTs. And we've seen some of that play out in the type of projects where NFTs are launched first or tokens are launched first. And then there's a meta game that happens in those environments even before the game is launched. So I don't, for instance, think that Star Atlas or Illuvium or other sort of game projects launching tokens ahead of time is necessarily an issue, provided that they cater towards the audiences in that manner, for instance. Um, I think the problem that's happened is that um, many of those uh, game studios didn't consider that the issuance of the token is more akin to an IOU than an actual sort of raising of capital, as it were. And raising of capital is still a kind of IOU, but it's a different kind of IOU, right? It's an IOU to an investor, whereas raising a token is really sort of an IOU to your customer, right? Who becomes an owner. Uh, And, you know, when you sell someone an NFT, but the NFT doesn't yet have its promised utility, then actually that is still an IOU. (laughs) It doesn't change that, right? And, and, And I think, you know, when you look at, for instance, Kickstarter style games or games that have con- consistently fundraised, like I think, you know, like Starship, this is, I think, Star Citizen, for instance, right? I mean, that's a game in the Web2 in the web world that essentially has crowdfunded, I think, close to the tune of $400 million. Really? Um, and the I game still hasn't launched after, you know, like like after 10 years or something like that. 
right? So, it, 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 but the community loves it and they love the experience of what's being built, even if the game itself isn't playable uh, in the full extent, because, you know, that's, that's, um, that, that was expected and, and that's something that they want and that's okay, right? So, so again, I think the token in and of itself can be a product in that vein, but I think sometimes that element is often misunderstood and not really fully integrated um, into that setup. The other thing is when you talk about mass onboarding, kind of like what we saw in the early days of mobile gaming, is that mass onboarding uh, from a certain set of gamers isn't actually necessarily happening from AAA. AAA is very important uh, because, you know, the top gamers would enjoy it and it shows the quality bar where it is. But it's actually casual gaming that brings people into the... Candy because Crush. You can see what Farmville. it's like, right? Like, yeah, Farmville, Candy Crush, Angry Birds, right? I yeah. mean, these are the gaming environments that actually onboarded the masses. And so certain projects, for instance, like Gamey, uh, which are sort of, you know, running games inside the Telegram ecosystem, for instance, are the kind of games that can help onboard people for them to understand, you know, what it means to have a game that's Web3, for instance. Oh, he has a wallet? What does that do? Oh, I can actually maybe sort of get an NFT? Why would I have an NFT? Oh, I can trade that? Or how can I use it, for instance? That's actually what casual games have been doing very well from the transitioning of mobile games. And once those gamers who, you know, never thought mobile games could be fun or interesting. If you remember, the hardcore gamers were like, mobile games, I'll never touch that. Like in 2000, 2012, that's not a real game, right? And, two years you know, later, two years later in the games. airport. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? Playing, you know, Call of Duty or big strategy games or Fortnite on mobile of all things, for instance, right? right? Um, but also because now a huge new crowd of people who have never sort of really played games before have now experienced, I guess, the wonders of gameplay but they would never do this if they played Call of Duty or Fortnite as their first game. They would do that because they enjoyed Angry Birds or Candy Crush or Farmville. And they go, okay, actually, that's kind of fun. And maybe Farmville and Candy Crush are not the top games today. That's okay. They did their job. They're, they're fun and popular, but they onboarded you know, basically billions of people into gaming, which then moved on from there to other types of games because they basically went from you know, level one to level two to level three. And I think we're still at the level one stage of blockchain games, because meaning that um, people still need to understand sort of what it means to have true digital own, um, sort of asset ownership inside gaming items, and what it means to have tokens that are actually usable outside of your gaming in, uh, sort of uh, ecosystem, and to have a sense of financial literacy that isn't necessary in Web2 games, but is actually quite important in Web3 games. Was Axie Infinity sort of our first iteration of exactly what you're describing, because I think a lot of people were surprised at the traction that it got, considering it wasn't the yes. most fun game in the world. I think it proved the economic side, which is that if you can make more money playing this game, even if it's not fun and just sitting there and doing it over and over and over again, then you can cleaning a house or whatever else people in the Philippines were doing that paid them less, that they proved the economic model on one side, but also proved that one of these just very simple, engaging games could really go somewhat viral. Yes. And I think the Axie Infinity was, Axie Infinity was an example of showing the way, right? It's not the end goal. It's just the beginning of, you know, what we can see. And now on the Ronin chain, which is basically, uh, you know, where, where Axie, you know, is, is, is operating from, um, the chain that they're using, there's another game called Pixels, which is also, um, you know, part of the Animoca portfolio uh, that actually has now over 100,000 DAU. Uh, uh, which also sort of emerged because of the fact that the Axie users that are basically playing Axie and have experienced Axie have, are now going sort of to other games. And so you can see that effect beginning to evolve and grow from that. I think the thing that was fascinating about Axie is that, you know, it demonstrated that you can sort of create and improve and teach a form of financial literacy through essentially a, a token um, and, 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 and sort of crypto um, integration to people who have, you know, no financial literacy in the traditional sense, may haven't even gone to university, right? So I think that's that's really uh, sort of um, uh, exciting and interesting. And it also showed that uh, sort of, you know, I think one of the criticisms that people say, well, the game wasn't particularly fun. But, you know, when you look at some of the popular games in mobile, things like, you know, like the, the tapping games, right? Or what they call idle games. Actually, you know, these are very popular and fun games and you play them endlessly without value. Yeah. And the other, I think, story to your point, not only about the financial education, is that people were willing to jump through these massive UX UI 
challenges, figure out how to open a MetaMask wallet, bridge to Ronin, do all these things that are complicated even for someone who's crypto native because they really wanted to play and they really wanted the opportunity to make money. So, Because I think one of the big arguments that I've made as well is that the UX and UI is just not ready for the mainstream. Right. It, it, it's not as easy as Web2. You can't just come sign in, start playing. You got to do all these things in advance. But people did it when there was incentive to do it. Correct. Right. Uh, but and but and also they were willing to sort of go around the App Store or in this case, the Google Play Store. So they were side loading it because at the time it wasn't allowed to have the Axie game, you know, basically installed through Google Play. But I would say that, you know, in order to sort of really grow the ecosystem in the space, I think from a game design and a tutorial standpoint, Game companies can do a better job in teaching people around what it means to have a wallet, for instance. Yeah. And I think, you know, game designers are, you know, among some of the best storytellers in the world from an interactive sense. And so if you can actually somehow find a way to tell the story about maybe not MetaMask, but some wallet that's, you know, uh, actually self-custody and still sort of, you know, not as complex as what we have right now with, with MetaMask in terms of, you know, saving your sort of, you know, key phrases and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and being able to sort of use it and, and trade with the assets and understanding it. Um, and I think we can do that inside games uh, because today when you play a game, any new game you've never played before, you go through tutorial and you learn a new skill every time you play these tutorials. And today we know about first person shooters or we know about RPG rules and we know about WASD and like whatever these things are. These are things that were taught to us that uh, were not skills that we had before and now have become common. I think we can do the same also in Web3 games and sort of create these new narratives and sort of engage them through the um, craft of storytelling. Right. So we started this conversation sort of joking about how the metaverse is not, in fact, dead. I think a lot of these narratives, NFTs, metaverse, we can even say DeFi, but we'll save that for another conversation. But all of these things that had their cycle, right, the NFT summer, the metaverse fall, whatever they were, seem, seem to be have forgotten for dead. But in fact, I think the real use cases, once again, are being built this cycle. So of all of those things, or individually, which ones are you guys really heavily investing in right now and really excited that you think can come to fruition you know, in the next year or two, as opposed to the five or 10-year time horizon? So we've done over 140 investments in the space, and we're also building in our own sort of areas as well. So there's a lot coming out. Um, you know, I would say it's, you know, one of the things also we don't want to look at specifically in saying here's like one or two or three. It's a little bit like yeah. picking our favorite child. Yeah, yeah, put know, a, put, a, put them in unfair. buckets for sure. Yeah, put them in buckets. Yeah, yeah. I don't um, want to get you in trouble also, with the projects you're invested in either. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but also but also I think um, games are one of those things where sometimes they become breakout successes in areas that you simply wouldn't expect them from. Because they become hits, right? I mean, remember Flappy Bird, for instance, right? It's yeah, like, I mean, what was that? And it just just emerged from everyone. And that's the powerful thing about games, that they become viral because people love to play them. And there's a mechanic that people might seem sort of whimsical or fun or even ridiculous. And it just sort of takes off, right? And, and we've seen that phenomenon happen time and time again. But in general, I would say, you know, there's a couple areas that I think are quite exciting in the shorter term, shall we say, right? Things that are already sort of uh, about to come out or are out in sort of betas. Uh, the first one that we do really like is gaming because gaming is basically hyper casual. They have, you know, I think something like 40, 50, 60 games already have over, I think, 220 to 250,000 daily active users. Um, is one of the top gaming, uh, sort of, if not the number one gaming application on Telegram. Uh, and as you may have heard, uh, Animoca Brands has become uh, one of the largest, if not the largest validator um, on Ton most I recently uh, because we also think that Telegram as an ecosystem is going to be one of the sort of major drivers for mass adoption in terms of, you know, Web3 adoption through, you know, things like Ton Wallet, for instance. So I think that's um, that's sort of one narrative that we really like, the hyper-casual side of things. Um, but then also we're really excited on the sort of AAA-ish type of area. So Phantom Galaxies is a title that has been in, I guess, an alpha stage for quite a while. And now if you look at the gameplay of, of, of where it's come, it's actually very high quality. It's basically like, Starship sort of, you know, turns mecha battle game, but you can play it right now. Uh, and, and that's sort of interesting. Um, and it just sort of got, came out on both the Steam and Epic um, sort of uh, store. Um, so you can basically download and try that out. It's a demonstration that, you know, Web3 games can sort of be on par visually and gameplay like as into the top games. 
Um, you know, Rec League is an example of something that's pretty cool. Um, it's, you know, the Web2 version isn't out yet, but the business model is interesting. Owners of the NFTs in Rec League are able to basically um, generate a revenue share on their items when people buy the skins in the Web2 version of the game, for instance. So again, these are the kind of new designs and models of how people are experimenting around integrating Web2 uh, and Web3. Of course, Sandbox, you know, it's still going through seasonal uh, sort of alphas, but, you know, next year, hopefully it will be able to launch the full version, which I think, again, is really exciting. You've got big brands developing on it. Um, there's investments on, on sort of, you know, the various lands. There's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of unique experiences that people can now have on sort of the sandbox metaverse. Uh, and when this is sort of launched fully, could kind of have like a Roblox slash Minecraft type effect, for instance. Right. So, I mean, these are some of the sort of projects within the stable of Animoca brands that, you know, are more short term. But you have a lot of great other games that are sort of, you know, coming out. You know, we recently announced investment in Farcana, right? Um, you know, we're very supportive of, uh, you know, of what's happening with, you know, obviously Pixels, which we're involved in, um, Axe Infinities and having new seasons. So, yeah, I mean, here I go, right? I could just rattle them all down. So, yeah, and then everything else. You did say there's over 100 right of them, right? We've got a movie in the background yeah, yeah. for anybody who's watching. <laughs> exactly. Talk about the sandbox, right? So, yes. I think one of the best examples of the absolute FOMO and insanity of the last cycle was, you know, Snoop Dogg buys a mansion or buys a plot of land and then it's $2 million to buy a shack next to Snoop Dogg. I literally have never since checked the value of land. I have to imagine that it's dramatically depressed, much like everything else in crypto. So I don't think that's unique to them. But do you see a time when land in the metaverse, for example, becomes uh, as valuable as what people were paying for it at the top of the last cycle? Can that bounce back? So first, I think the value is denominated generally in the value of sand, right? So I right. think we need to look at it from the perspective, not only in terms of, I think, dollar terms. I think we need to look at it from the perspective Fair. of sort of relative sand terms, because sand is essentially the uh, the, the currency of sandbox. So, but relative to, to where sand was in terms of its value, in terms of quantum, I think you will find, we will find that there will be a return of that based on the fact that we think generally more people will be going into the metaverse because, you know, it's just where the growth path is happening. We're seeing the numbers in terms of the end users. So I think we'll see, broadly speaking, you know, from a cycle standpoint, you have sort of these sort of quasi boom bust cycles. And right now, if you were to tell me um, what's the alternative to Sandbox in sort of the Web3 metaverse, truth be told, I don't think there's very many, right, that can actually sort of compete in terms of what Sandbox is offering. Yeah, Mana was the other name, I guess, at the time that, you know, we're yeah, I mean, kind the of the prices is, were going yeah, Central exactly. is slightly different, um, and it's also not voxel based, right? right. Uh, and I think the the you know the other thing is major financial institutions and other type of groups have developed in Sandbox, for instance. So right. so from a launch standpoint, I think we'll see some pretty amazing things. Um, but I think you know the growth of the utility and the growth of sort of um, sort of the networks are going to basically uh, sort of are the ones that are going to help sort of deliver value to the ownership of you know you know what you have. Um, and I think it comes down to network effects, right? How many more network effects are we able to build inside this? And what we expect is that the ownership of land is going to give you network effects above and beyond inside Sandbox itself. Kind of like what you see, for instance, in things like um, sort of, you know, um, the Bored Apes as an example. Today, when you have a Bored Ape um, or even a Mochaverse NFT, for instance, you're not only using it as a PFP or as a sort of avatar, as it were. It becomes a membership pass for different activities or becomes an access pass with products and goods and services because you are now a qualified member, a user. Become, and, and that actually means that owning one of those NFTs gives you hundreds more network effects uh, that are outside of the ecosystem. And I think ownership of land in Sandbox is developing into a similar situation. Initially, the network effects are built from within the Sandbox, but now ownership of land or ownership of land next to Snoop, for instance, is going to give utility, I think, in other ways that are sort of going to be unexpected and fun. Uh, and so, so as we see often in these markets, kind of like, you know, back in the early days with the dot-com bust, you have a run-up that seems hyped and a little bit sort of ahead of, and uh, running ahead of where it is, then it's coming down. But fundamentally, when you think about how value accrues in the metaverse and how data value accrues and how network effects build, provided that, of course, Sandbox is remaining in, in its pole position that is right now, that they will then ultimately not just retain its value, but actually increase 
in its value because the utility and the demand will 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 increase. That's of course prefaced on the fact that we think Web three is going to grow, which is certainly our premise. Yeah, I mean, I think we all have some PTSD from the last cycle, so it escapes my memory exactly what they are. But to your point about accruing value outside of the metaverse itself, we had some of the biggest brands in the world start to establish a presence inside the sandbox, right? I don't remember if it was Gucci or LVMH. Now it's like again, it's escaping my mind as those were daily stories, but they're all there. Right. They wouldn't be yes. doing that if they only cared about uh, that value remaining within that specific platform. No, no, no. And I think the one thing to consider is that the average, I mean, this is a, this is a stat we looked at. I'm not sure what the most recent stat is, but, you know, when we looked at it not too long ago, the average landowner in the sandbox had a value of between half a million to a million US dollars in their public wallets. So now knowing that, you can like, okay, hold on a second. It suddenly starts to make sense for an LVMH or Gucci or an HSBC or Standard Chartered to start opening a presence in the sandbox. Not even because you want to build the best gaming experience, but because you want to be close to your potential customers. Each one of these are you want access customers to wealthy people. or wealth clients. Yeah. yeah, exactly, right? I mean, if you, in the physical world, if you had a way in which you could reach every Lamborghini owner or every person who lived in Bel Air, what's that worth to you, right? There was a brief moment where Facebook allowed targeting ads by wealth. They got rid of it eventually, but there was a brief moment. My wife uh, was an SEO expert and worked with a ton of brands at her own company. And the best she ever did was that brief moment when Facebook allowed you basically to target people as specifically by wealth, because to your point, you could literally just find the exact customer you were looking for in one place. Yes. And that's the power of Web3 because now that's open and that's signaled because you own an NFT or you own land in Sandbox or you can see what you have in your wallet. And that's the thing that the platforms like Facebook actually don't like because they make money from the fact that they obscure the way garden. that you access a customer. Yeah. 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 Well, it's not just walled garden. It's the fact that they want you to basically waste your advertising dollars. They don't want efficiency because efficiency means that you basically just spend less with them. So it's much better that you're inefficient, that you don't quite know who the customer is, that you kind of make it complicated and hard to sort of target. And then you have to hire all these people who can sort of make sort of some kind of sense out of this sort of, I guess, artificial mess that they've created so that you can sort of spend your bullets in the wrong way. And in Web3, you can simply by owning these NFTs or targeting the people who have these NFTs, actually, you can go directly to those customers and say, I've got a deal for you. So that's uh, that's sort of changes um, this whole sort of uh, paradigm and flips the whole targeting upside down. So they established these uh, presence in the sandbox during the last cycle. These large brands have they continued to build throughout the bear market? Do they yes, still they believe in it? Yes, they have. And every time a new season comes out, I think um, there might be a new season coming out for sandbox very soon again. You can see the progress of these developments. Right. So so they 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 actually want to keep launching it but you can't launch them until the season is open, which means they're only open kind of like a theme park yeah. at certain periods of time, partially to sort of, you know, do the load testing and still go through the alpha and beta phases. But yeah, they're still developing in a pretty big way. That's incredible to hear. Uh, we always hear sort of the meme that the best things are built during the bear market because nobody's concerned with price and nobody's worried. You just forget yes. that it's happening. And then all of a sudden, it magically appears yeah. when prices go up, everything's there that you needed this whole time. That's right. Yeah, That's right. which is That's really right. incredible. Then for you, building the Mochaverse, which I would like to talk about more specifically, how that's differentiated from something like Sandbox, which you guys are obviously heavily involved in, you still decided to build your own metaverse. But what does the vision of the metaverse down the road look like to you? I think a lot of people originally thought it was Ready Player One or Wally, you know, where you're completely immersed. That's your whole life. Uh, you plug in there to get out of the misery of your other life. Is it a game or is it also maybe something that's more like an AR augmented reality where it's something that becomes a part of your everyday world? You're wearing your your uh, Ray-Bans and you look at a advertisement and it's more interactive than it would have been. And it's simply, you know, just something that enhances your environment. So first, I think, Things like AR and VR are additional interfaces into the what we call the open metaverse, but they aren't the metaverse in and of itself. The metaverse for us starts with digital property rights, as in the things that you can own, because that's your digital identity. If you rent it, 
which is kind of what we're doing today in platforms like Instagram, whether it's your ID, um, you know, your handle, or even when you play games like Roblox, you're renting assets, you're renting presence. They're not yours. And so from our perspective, they're not real. So that's kind of where we draw the line between how we define the metaverse, which, you know, is maybe more universal in Web3, but for people outside of the space, they may not understand or appreciate that. So I just wanted just to make sure we, we clarify um, clarify that point. When we talk about sort of um, the, the experiential layer, the, the thing that we look at when we talk about sort of gaming is that gaming is one of the elements that is critical to the experience of the metaverse, but isn't the metaverse in and of itself just because you can play a game. It's one of the many things you can do in the metaverse. And we also think that the metaverse is kind of multidimensional in experience, as in there's not going to be one metaverse that you play. In fact, there's going to be thousands and thousands of them in the same way that we experience in the physical world, you know, different cities and different countries and different cultures, because they actually represent different things to us. And we can navigate from point to point. And really what people are fighting for is attention. But attention doesn't always work when you're trying to address the same thing for hundreds of millions of users. This just doesn't work, right? Like one of the reasons why both Minecraft and Roblox, um, actually Roblox is number one, Minecraft is number two, most popular game in the world, ahead of Fortnite, ahead of Call of Duty, ahead of PUBG and those things, is because they're created by the end users in custom experiences, right? You buy a Minecraft license, not because you want to play just Minecraft, but because you want to enter the world of Forge or Mindplex or all the other gaming experiences we've built. You're not playing Roblox because the graphics are insanely good, right? You're, you're playing Roblox because you're actually wanting to enjoy all the other games that have built and all the other communities that are in there. So what you're really doing is you're immersing yourselves in different cultures and the diversity of those different cultures is why it's attractive. And I think the metaverse, the open metaverse is built in much the same way, but you know, through ownership. So that means we can have the sandbox and we can have Decentraland and we can have pixels and we can have Axe Infinity and we should be able to navigate and travel and we should be able to interoperate with our assets and move them around as we see fit. And what we also expect is that other metaverses, kind of what you see with the sandbox, will then integrate them inside the game with an experience. So if you have a board ape, you actually can use a board ape in the sandbox and it basically shows up in a voxel style. Right. And you know this will happen in sort of other gaming universes as well because they become something that is transportable and and become sort of you know your identity layer as it were. So so I think that's how we think of the metaverse and and you know we we also think it's important to have this type of diversity because people need to have choice and they want to have that and in web3 the economics the unit economics work to have smaller metaverses like you can have you know a a game with tens of thousands of users and it would still be sustainable yeah it's not going to be a billion dollar enterprise but it you know it works you can't have that in web2 if you have a game with 10,000 users it will die because there's yeah. no revenue for that but in Web3, a game with tens of thousands of users is still good enough because unit economics are large enough to sustain as it is in the real world because the economic um, sort of model is more akin to a small city or small town as opposed to a closed economy as it is in Web2. With that vision of what it will look like in the future, how much does interoperability between blockchains play into that? Because it's still pretty clunky to be able to, uh, if they build something on Solana and another one you love is on Ethereum, it's still pretty clunky to move that board ape from one to the other. It is clunky right now. Yeah, it is pretty clunky. But, you know, companies like Layer Zero, uh, you know, sort of, you know, which is also part of the Animocus portfolio, are basically sort of, you know, bridging those gaps. And we're at this level of, you know, from a technological standpoint, the infrastructure around interoperability is and, and bridging basically assets across. Um, and, and swapping them across is obviously not super elegant at the moment, but people are working on it. Really smart people are are trying to make that work. And, you know, typically with technology, it's not a matter of sort of um, if, but when. And we think the same will happen there. Um, and we're kind of early anyway. The need to have interoperable assets right now isn't as critical as it will be in the future, because we're still so early on on sort of that growth curve. That you know the sort of um, people are going to be more focused around sort of the experiences that are being built within their own units, but when you look at, for instance, what happened to the NFT projects like the Board Apes or the Cool Cats or even Mochaverse, for instance, right? You can see how these have become sort of gateways for other experiences. So I want to make use of my Board Ape in you know Reckly, but I can also use it in Sandbox, and I can also use it maybe in Pixels, and I can do that type of stuff now. Because of the fact that, you know, I own the assets and I don't need to seek permission. That's the point. You know, yeah. I don't need to seek permission from the actual 
creator of it. I just need permission from the owner of it. And the owners are like, that's cool because now I have more use cases for my NFT. So go ahead and do whatever you want with it because I would enjoy that and I get value from that. So, so I think that's kind of how that area will continue to grow and develop. Right. And you obviously think the future of the sandbox is very bright as one of these and all the metaverses in general. So why build your own? What differentiates Mochaverse from what already exists and where you guys are already deploying capital and, and resources? Well, Mochaverse isn't really a metaverse in the classic sense. Mochaverse is at heart an identity layer and a governance layer for everything that Animoca has invested in and, and put out. So give you an example. If you own a Mochaverse NFT right now, um, it gives you governance rights over a portion of our tokens, for instance, like ApeCoin. And you can participate in the ApeCoin uh, sort of DAO governance through essentially the ownership of NFTs, which gives you a pretty powerful voice. It's almost like a super PAC, if you will, in political right. terms, uh, without actually having to own ApeCoin, because by owning the uh, Mochaverse NFT, you can vote on those things. And we've been doing this for a while, and it's actually been a really interesting model and also an interesting model of decentralization, as in... So, so you can see that Mochaverse on one level is kind of like a DAO of DAOs because we have so many projects that are sort of turning into DAOs or our DAOs, and we want to hand over that governance to basically our, our, our community, uh, which actually helps us as well because they help run and sort of, you know, keep those communities and those ecosystems accountable, which is kind of hard to do if we have to do everything ourselves, especially because we have something like 450 portfolios, right? So it's kind of tough to do that. Um, and you'll notice, for instance, that we've not just, you know, we own the sandbox, but we've also invested in sort of dozens and dozens of other uh, metaverses and in the early days, yeah, and in, including in projects like Other Deed. And, you know, in the beginning, I was like, isn't that a competitor? And I think that misses the point because in Web3, it's about building in the shared network, right? It's not about zero-sum outcomes, meaning that if, the, if Sandbox is really successful, that isn't just to the benefit of Sandbox because the assets are interoperable, because your assets are liquid, because you can move them around. The rest of the ecosystem gets to benefit as well. When Axie Infinity became the sensation that it was in 21, all the sort of value didn't sit inside Axie. It started to spread across the entire gaming ecosystem. And GameFi had its moment. And how many hundreds of guilds sprung up because of that? And how many game companies actually were able to ride the wave of actual revenue growth because of the fact that Axie Infinity you know, became the fastest game for billion dollars in revenue in the history of games, for instance, right? So, so I think, you know, the, the whole point is that when you build in an open network, actually you benefit from being open. And so when we're building in this manner, it almost doesn't matter if it's Sandbox or one of our portfolio companies or even companies outside. If one of them succeeds, everyone basically benefits from, from the growth of that halo effect. We see that a little bit today, right? For instance, when GameFi tokens in the last 30 days started to rally, Crazy. it wasn't one token, right? Do, Everything yeah, else we, we see that in crypto growth. always, yeah. It's, uh... Exactly, exactly. And so I think that's the spirit of it. And so that's why, you know, it's not about sort of, you know, one versus the other. Actually, one helps the other. That's kind of the spirit of it. And I think the other thing about Mochaverse that we found is this is what we have Mocha ID, which is our sort of digital decentralized identity layer, uh, our, our DID is a way basically to sort of unify sort of our users in one network, but in a decentralized manner, so that we can basically solve things like KYC and identity. Because what we found, for instance, when we sell NFTs, and we do, for instance, um, you know, uh, KYC on them, those wallets are often sold off to someone else yeah. to get on those whitelists. It's very common, right? Um, but with a soulbound NFT that is actually your identity, you can't really do that. It also means that we no longer have to re-KYC that identity time and time again, because we know who that is, which means anyone who uses the identity layer can save money, for instance. And also because we're accruing experience points, um, even though I don't know who that person necessarily is, um, you know, and there's zero knowledge proof, which basically means I don't have access to all of the data, but I can sort of know, for instance, what kind of gamer he is, if that's revealed, or what his interest is, or how valid he is, or how many sort of, you know, how, how much experience points he has, because how much... You know, how much he's contributed, I can now target that customer in a certain manner and offer value, shared value across each other. Uh, and, and that to us is really important to sort of create that new identity trust layer into Web3 so we can help onboard more games more seamlessly into that. And, you know, other many of the games that we're launching can benefit from that user profile because otherwise every game that launches has to build a new customer sort of, you know, a customer sort of index, as it were. And but because it's decentralized, um, the ownership belongs to the end user and it's up to the end user whether they want to use it or not, rather than a platform. 
uh, like a Steam or an App Store, for instance, uh, which is why we're doing it as a DID. Um, and also it helps, we're also thinking of it as the beginning of a kind of quasi, I wouldn't say it's not social fi, but essentially a social network that helps unify sort of all of our portfolio companies and the end users in the portfolio companies into a common framework where we can then share the benefits of the network effect. Because we have so many companies that can collaborate with each other, but it's really, really difficult, especially when we're going from 450 to 500, 600, 700 portfolio companies. Um, how, how can we do that efficiently? Well, if you actually have a sort of social network that is validated through something like Mochaverse, then actually, you know, you can work with each other knowing that you're real. And we can allow people who are outside of the animal ecosystem to join it by basically being a part of Mochaverse, right? right. Um, which is the other thing. We want other people to participate in the network and not only because we invest in you, but because you might actually want to participate by owning a Mochaverse, then you can be part of the network as well. So, so that's kind of really the vision. So it's not really a metaverse kind of like sandbox. It's right. additive to other people's metaverses. Right. You talked about the idea kind of that a rising tide lifts all boats, right? You see one of these coins go and then everything sort of follows it in the narrative. You get this groundswell. But is that groundswell enough to carry this to mainstream adoption or does something have to break through? Do you need the killer game, the killer app, that one thing that goes wildly viral to carry them all up? Oh, I think, you know, it's going to be a combination of all this, but I think it's the the one sort of viral game or viral activity um, that's actually going to sort of really sort of capture people's imagination. And I think in sort of, you know, the earlier days when talks space like the Philippines, that's what Axie Infinity did, for instance, for people in the yeah. Philippines. And today, by the way, in the Philippines, you know, they have a very pro-crypto stance. Uh, the SEC regulator is actually sort of yep. trying to promote this. Uh, it's a political agenda because it's built so much opportunity in places like the Philippines, right? So I think we need some some of these some more of these moments, but on a, on a more global scale. I think the one thing that's very different in sort of the mass adoption challenge in from Web two to Web three is around financial literacy. So the Web three user is actually quite financially literate. I don't mean that to say that he's necessarily a successful investor, but they understand you know, risk and investment and money. And by the way, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily a professional investor. Or so they're good investor. at it, but they at least uh, have a comprehension yes. that it exists. <laughs> they have a comprehension. They have an aptitude and interest in it. They understand kind of, you know, what they're doing in a certain way, right? And and they're comfortable with it, right? But the majority of the world isn't that. And it used to be that the people who were these kind of investors tended to coalesce around Wall Street, which was also kind of the small elite club. And the rest of the world, which is generally labor focused, wasn't investing. Yes, they had a bank account, but you know that was the extent of their financial inclusion, access, but not necessarily knowing what to do with it. Because you know when you actually go into a bank, they don't say, here's how we can teach you financial literacy. It's more like, here's a product we want you to buy. We'll, we'll charge you insane fees and you don't need to know nothing. Don't, you don't need to know anything. Just give us the money and we'll take care of everything for you, right? And, and I think this is the problem. We have done a really bad job as a society to sort of onboard people into financial systems because it wasn't in the interest of the financial uh, players to do that because they wanted people to give them the money to do it rather than they doing it themselves. And in Web3, quite a few people actually do that themselves and have an understanding because frankly, there's no advisors, there's no JP Morgans of Web3, right? And actually, I think people have sort of learned the ropes and built their own sort of wealth and opportunity that way. So onboarding from Web2 to Web3, I think um, Web3 gaming is one of the most powerful ways of doing it because not just because of tutorials, but because through a kind of play money, as it were, you can start to teach financial literacy at a young age, but also for older people who play it, such that they then end up becoming comfortable or at least more adept at sort of what to do with these type of, you know, I guess, tokens and NFTs and digital property that you have. And I think that is the where the adoption has been struggling because, you know, we've onboarded millions of Web2 users into Web3 with other games that we've launched, but they weren't really Web3 gamers. They were Web2 gamers that had a wallet. That's not really Web3, right? right? And so the idea that you're adopting a user and you have just user numbers isn't enough, right? I need to be actually doing something with my digital assets. I need to understand its value or at least sort of, you know, do something about it. And that's basically the part that I think um, we can do better. Uh, and that's what's needed. And I think you know, we're getting better at it. And 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 the trigger of the game, the tutorial, the storytelling, and also education. We're doing stuff like with Open Campus, 
um, are, are ways in which we're trying to sort of educate um, the space around sort of more financial literacy and, you know, basically more adoption into Web3 because you understand why you need to do it. So I could talk to you about this stuff for hours. It gets me insanely pumped, but I'm also cognizant of the fact it's almost 2 a.m. where you are. But I do want to ask you one more question because you made me sure, so bullish. But was there any point in this cycle or any of the previous cycles where you said, damn it, maybe I was wrong. <laughs> maybe this isn't going to work, right? Because I think your average investor in crypto or these or Web3 had those moments where they said, this is all dead. Right. I know your answer, but I just was there any point at which your conviction was at all shaken about any of it? No, it wasn't shaken. I mean, you can see it from the fact that we continue to invest even when the FTX sort of, you know, situation happened, which was really was the best about time. It, pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty uh, low point. We continue to invest in companies. Uh, we continue to sort of, you know, I think, uh, you know, I don't know what the status at this moment, but I think we're one of the top investors in terms of quantum of deals. You know, in 2023, in Web3, for instance, um, you know, I mean, you know, we've done stuff in AI as well, but we've never stopped investing in Web3. Um, we actually think AI and Web3 are quite integrated, for instance, and quite sort of codependent. Um, so, so, so no. Um, and I think part of it comes from not the fact that, uh, not so much that we have a, um, because we're not your typical investors, right? Because we don't invest as a fund. We invest mostly out of our balance sheet. So we take a very long view on this one. And there's just a general conviction that owning your digital property and having digital property rights is just such a better future. So it doesn't almost even matter whether we're right or wrong. We just have to make it work, right? It's like it's like die by the sword type of thing. It it, it doesn't. So so um, even if the situation looks dire, we still have to make it work because isn't it just a much better outcome for everyone involved, right? And and so that's also one of the reasons why you see us being so prolific in sort of media channels and talking and being at events, you know, whether it's us or Sandbox or, you know, other people in, in the group, because we also want to evangelize, right? Bringing and mass sort of helping to mass onboard people into, into Web3 isn't just one product or an application. It's about telling the story. It's about evangelizing and telling the story in a manner that people who are not from Web3 understand. And I think that's the part that we can do better as an industry. Because when we start talking about NFTs and tokens and, and sort of, you know, you know, people get lost, right? So we have to explain to them, you know, why it matters and sort of, you know, this idea that we can be stakeholders in the ecosystems that we help build. The fact that we can have ownership in the things that we help construct in the virtual world. That's the kind of thing that people go, oh, actually, I don't own this or maybe that is important. Right. And that's was, you know, that was sort of the, the, the crux of my TED talk was, which was something that was reaching out to all sorts of people who know nothing about Web3, was I didn't talk about tokens or crypto or that kind of stuff, because I felt that they were going to get lost in that narrative. The moment they hear the word, they probably just, their eyes glaze over and they just forget, right? So we have to communicate with them in a manner that they appreciate and understand. And I think this is something that um, we we can do better as an industry guy overall. Well, I'm glad we have people like you who have to make it work. Uh, my uh, you know my dusty old portfolio thanks you, and I'm sure plenty of other people thank you for sticking by it throughout the uh, the depths of the bear cycle and the lows of FTX. As you said, it really was a pretty dire time, and it's nice to at least see some optimism back in the market. But I'm glad that you've maintained that optimism throughout. Yeah, I'm glad we finally got to do this. Uh, been trying to thank do you. it for a long time. I've always loved the conversations on spaces. So thank you so much for staying up late to have this talk of with course. us. Of course. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.